patient has the typical symptoms of catecholamine excess, there is no reason to do other fun functional imaging studies because the tumors that are about between four and five centimeters, the likelihood to be metastatic at the first presentation is extremely low. I use the MIBG especially for those where I think that those patients may have uh, or may be considered in the future for uh, the MIBG therapy, and that's extremely important. For the octal scan, we, do, uh, we don't use octal scan uh, because um, it does not work very well for patients with the primary tumors, especially for the adrenals. Uh, for the adrenal tumors, uh, the sensitivity of the octal is approximately about 40-45%. I cannot give you very good data about the extra adrenal pheochromocytomas or paragangliomas. I think it will be low, except, you know, there are two exceptions. One exception are those that they had the neck paragangliomas, because the octal is very good, and I would say that uh, its place uh, uh, has a second place actually, maybe after the uh, fluoro uh, dopa, because the fluoro dopa is number one, and then the uh, octrotide or octroscan is extremely good for head and neck paragangliomas, and that was published before. It's not coming from you know our or other institutions. Uh, yeah, recently it is coming, you know, from, uh, especially I think it was from Holland, uh, that they were very good initial studies for the octal scan. The second is if you have a metastatic pheochromocytoma. The problem is if you have a metastatic pheochromocytoma and you use octal scan or gallium dotatoc or, you know, other, mm, uh, other modalities, what to do with the patient? You would say, okay, you, the patient is positive, you will treat the patient, like, you know, MIBG. MIBG is positive, you will treat the patient. I can tell you I had not too many, but, you know, I would say eight patients or ten patients uh, be sent, you know, for the uh, octroidite therapy. None of them responded very well. It's very interesting. They are positive. Sometimes they are very highly positive but the responses are usually not so good. When I compare it with the MIBG, let's say they will have at the same positivity, and I, I would ask to choose MIBG over, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah. the therapy with the yeah, octrotide, yeah. I would definitely use the MIBG. What is the reason? You know, I don't, I don't know, but somehow, uh, octroitite is not working so well compared to, uh, to MIBG, but there are, of course, uh, exceptions, definitely. Thank you. Uh, Karen, uh, yes. we, we know that uh, um, uh, octroscan uh, is uh, um, quite sensitive for head and neck paraganglioma. Sure. Okay. But I don't see any, any role for not to scan in patients with head and neck paraganglioma at all. I mean, in clinical practice. If you have a reference radiologist, which mm. is an expert, mm. I mean, with an MRI of the, of the region, I mean, he can detect uh, any, <coughs> any, uh, any head and neck paraganglioma. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, would, I, I, don't, I don't really see a role for, I, for I think I think that Jorge will comment about it, but I would not agree with you fully because we have a patients where CT scan or MRI scan of the uh, head and neck is actually inferior to either the uh, fluorodopa or the octal scan. The reason for the octal scan may be to use in that region is not absolutely to think about the therapy to actually detect the extension of the disease and then to consider what will be the best approach. Because you know, and somebody had very good talk about you know, the head and neck paragangliomas, and when you have, a, for example, glomus jugulare, almost impossible to surgically <coughs> remove those tumors. You have either external radiation <clears throat> or even better, sometimes it's proton beam radiation because it's very, um, very focused compared to external, external radiation. 
I don't think, you know, using the octral scan for head and neck paraganglioma is always, you know, to think about the therapy. Although I know some patients that they went through the therapy because of the positivity on the uh, on the yes, but, I mean, yes, but it does not work, you know, uh, so, so well. We rather like to have the extension of the disease and to suggest what would be good plan together with the surgery, or I would say neurosurgery, or sometimes the chemotherapy, because the chemotherapy has to be used as a, let's say, a CBD or some other types of. But in, malign in malignant cases. Well, yeah, in malignant cases, yes. Yeah. Yes, because they can have a lymphatic node, they can have and, a, you know, and, somewhere else. And yes. another question. Uh, in the but can I, I just yeah, wanted to make a, a comment. Because he has a lot of experience, you know. Well, I, you know, but just based on the, on the literature, there is no evidence base, meaning that there are very few studies that have compared. The initial study, Hegerly, uh, that looked at fluoridopa and MRI saw very high sensitivity for fluoridopa, high sensitivity for MR, but in some of the MRs they didn't they didn't see the tumor until the fluoridopa yes. was positive. So there are no comparisons, there are no yeah, good comparisons right. where where you have had studies like Carol has done where you do all three tests and then determine which one is uh, which one is best. Are you referring to head and neck paragangioma? Head and neck yes, paragangioma yes. specifically. Neck yeah. There are no, there are really no comparisons. Yeah. I would always uh, suggest, you know, that we discuss, uh, of course, you know, we have only nine patients, but Hegerle and some uh, Dr. Neumann and some others actually opened this area. And we have to be honest, we have to give them credit because they started several years ago. But, you know, the fluoridopa is most likely, you know, the best, you know, to detect the extension of the disease and you go from there. But I would agree if, you know, use the electro scan, uh, you would use it uh, with, the, with the goal maybe to treat the patient in the future. And you can treat the patient, you know, in the, in the future with head and neck paraganglioma, maybe more extensive disease, metastatic disease with the octrotype. That's possible, that's possible. But the responses or, you know, the outcome <coughs> is not so good like, for example, for MIBG. At least, you know, it's my small group of patients that we have, because, you know, in the United States, we are a little bit limited compared to European countries <coughs> using uh, the uh, octrotype for the treatment of patients with these tumors. The, one of the things with Dr. Tide, and I think this was true in, in, in your, in our series of NIH, right, was that although the sensitivity for malignant disease was somewhere in the 89%, that's per patient. When you looked at per lesion, then the sensitivity was much, much lower than, so, than and it really dropped. So per patient, it's very high, but not all of the lesions on those patients are positive. So, the, yes. the only a minority of those lesions are positive. Any more questions? Uh, I, I would like to rise on uh, in another issue. Uh, okay, uh, if you have a patient uh, with a single uh, extra adrenal paraganglioma mm -hmm. or a, an adrenal pheochromocytoma um, with high level of metanephrines, okay, uh, you let I mean the patient is operated after after surgery. You control metanephrines and they are perfectly normal, mm. okay? In the follow-up, are you using only the laboratory? Once you have, uh, of course, studied your person, you have a genetic profile, and you have already uh, performed a, a, a chest uh, a CT or MRI, and uh, there is nothing, okay? Uh, in the follow-up, I personally would rely only on lab result. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, we uh, suggest the patient after the operation is coming usually after six weeks, so some, some they say four weeks, but you usually be like six to eight weeks, and I rely on uh, plasma metanephrines. Uh, very soon, although we have it uh, already, is uh, plasma methoxytyramine and the chromogranin. 
And if something is positive, and of course I rule out, you know, the kidney failure, proton pump inhibitor, blah, 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 you know, so then we actually suggest to perform the anatomical imaging study. We don't go into the function imaging. But do you perform a CT scan or a, an MRI? It depends. With, we, with negative mm -hmm. results? No, no. In this negative uh, <coughs> laboratory results, we don't do that. We don't do that. But uh, of course, if it would be something positive and we rule out certain effects of, you know, and we already talked about it, we would either use the MRI or the CT scan. It depends on who is, uh, who is the patient. Dr. Menger, just, just uh, Dr. Menger, I'm sorry, Dr. Menger, and then you. Uh, Carol, explain to me when you would do a CT rather than an MRI. CT scan I would do in all patients except for three uh, indications. One, uh, one indication is liver metastatic lesions, because you know the MRI for the liver metastatic lesions is extremely good. Uh, I would also always com uh, combine with the ultrasound. Even ultrasound, somebody would say that low sensitivity, but ultrasound is very good. You know, for the uh, liver metastatic lesions, cardiac MRI and some bone lesions. This is uh, for the MRI. And of course, you know, and somebody mentioned it uh, yesterday, in uh, children, pregnant women, or those that they have an allergy to contrast uh, uh, CT. Do, do you think the CT would can pick up any pheochromocytoma any better than an MRI? Uh, CT is extremely good, you know, CT is, uh, uh, reads extremely well, you know, uh, radiologists, all, almost all radiologists, I cannot say all, because, you know, I'm not a radiologist, prefer the CT scan, because, you know, it uh, shows the structures very, uh, very well uh, over, the, over the MRI, and we always do, you know, the CT, uh, CT scan, but there are, of course, what I said, some, I cannot say maybe exceptions, but you know, by, not bias, but maybe towards, you know, to certain localization that are better, you know, to be imaged by the MRI. But you know, CT scan for the adrenal glands is extremely good. And uh, the MRI for T2 image that you, that was published before that almost all pheochromocytomas are hyper intense uh, on the T2 image. It's not absolutely correct because you maybe saw the paper from Dr. Resnick, Dr. Grossman. It came maybe about four or five years ago and they showed that at least about 40-50% of patients were having pheochromocytoma. They don't have a typical T2 image yeah. uh, that would be suggestive for the presence of pheochromocytoma. Thank you, Dr. Menger. Thank you, Dr. Patsa.